For Criminal Media's Policy, I'm Tabi Madiba, researcher of Migration Law and Society, Vanya Castro, joins me to discuss her book titled Citizen and Pariah, Somali Traders and the Regulation of Difference in South Africa. So Citizen and Pariah is a narrative account of South African law and society investigating violent crime affecting Somali shopkeepers. Can you tell us what drew your interest to the Somalian community, especially the traders? Well, it started off um, purely by coincidence. Um, I didn't ever um, endeavor to follow a career looking at examining um, foreign shopkeepers and Somali traders in South Africa. But I was always interested in refugee issues and always very interested in migration. Um, and I studied law. And then when I was carrying out my master's in law, a position for a researcher was advertised and the topic was looking at crime affecting foreign retailers. So it seemed like an interesting topic and I guess what kept me on the topic over all the years was that something made me uncomfortable about what I had um, encountered through my research on that first project. Um, and the project looked at access to justice for foreign shopkeepers, but increasingly I found that foreign shopkeepers and Somali shopkeepers who had been victims of crime, the issue was not so much framed as a law enforcement or a crime issue um, by stakeholders such as the police and political leaders, but an issue of regulation. And there was something there that made me uncomfortable, that victims of crime were not seen or framed the way I felt that, um, they normally are in the country, but instead they were problematized and, and the victims almost seen as a problem. The foreign businesses were increasingly in the discourse seen as needing to be regulated, curtailed, restricted. And, and that, that kind of framing I, I found worrying. And I guess the book tries to um, delve into it and to understand um, why that's the case and what does it mean about South Africa as a country and our, our law and politics. And you conducted interviews in Philippi, Kailicha and Greifontein. Can you tell us more about the research involved when you interviewed both the Somalians and South Africans? They were quite different. Um, I used quite different methodologies. Um, with Somalis, um, the Somali community in Cape Town is largely based in Belleville but not in the whole of Belleville, in a few streets in Belleville. So it's, it's quite small. Um, it's easy to get to know everyone. Well, you know, especially in the Belleville Somali community. I found that um, once you get introduced to a few people, um, you, you find that your access to people is quite easy. They're very open. And I also used a technique of, um, asking people that interview to introduce me to more people to interview, which is called the snowball technique. And then in addition to Somali retailers, I also interviewed South African residents um, in three areas in Cape Town, three townships in Cape Town. Um, but that was very different. So I think everyone knows Kailicha is a huge township. It's got, you know, I think the stats they say in 2011 said at least 400,000 people. Um, and it covers a vast area. So it wasn't the same as in Belleville, which is just a few streets and you get to know everyone. Um, but in a way that suited me because I, the, there was a lot of um, animosity and hostility, um, especially amongst certain South African business owners in Kailicha. So in a way, I wanted to be anonymous when I did my research. I didn't want to draw too much attention in Kylie to, to my research. Um, and so, yeah, the way I did my research in Kylie to, in Philippi and Cryfontein and the two townships there um, was more random. So I would look for people. I'd go on weekends because then you could interview people who were both not just if you go during the week, you're more likely to encounter un unemployed people, possibly. So I went on weekends and just spoke to people who happened to be waiting, sitting in their yards or standing on, on the sidewalk um, and seemed like they had time to speak. And it's not completely random, but it was far more random than the snowball technique. 
And I also found people in townships very open to being interviewed. So I actually had quite good experiences with both the Somali community and Somali traders, as well as in the township neighborhoods. I can't think of any other area of my work that I've learned so much um, as it's in doing that field research. And can you briefly talk to us more on how the power and authority that popular township groupings exercise at the local level can both compete with and override those of the state? That really what was a big learning lesson for me in terms of politics, because um, you know I always associated political authority with the police and local government and provincial governments and all the, your formal authorities. But very quickly, I realized that not everyone, and there's a, it differs from place to place quite a lot, but there was quite a widespread um, trend of people um, reporting issues to street committees, which were where they met very frequently, far more frequently than one would think, maybe once a week, even sometimes twice a week. And these fell under the, the umbrella organization of SANCO and street committees would take matters up to area committees and then um, ward committees and township committees. And, not, so, and it wasn't just about dealing with municipal issues, which normally you think would go to your municipal councillor, but rather than these parallel structures, but it was also dealing with crime, um, which usually you would think the state would have a monopoly on. Um, and these bodies would, in many ways, were for, more accessible and maybe more effective than the police. Um, they deal with matters such as domestic disputes, but then they'd also deal with setting sort of curfews in order to prevent crime. But then they'd also investigate crime and punish offenders, often just through fines and peaceful means, but often in really violent um, ways. And, and that I felt to the extent that they could actually murder people with relative impunity and in that way i really felt that their authority competed um, in a very significant way to the authority of the police in the state and in the context of heightened nationalism populism and economic inequality how can democratic and constitutional framework erode yeah, I think one of the lessons of the book, and the book, it's written in a narrative way. So it's not written in a way where it tries to engage too much in theory and long arguments. It's really a story and you can read the story and take what you like. But I think one of the key lessons, if you read the story, is that it's very difficult for democracy and constitutionalism to survive in a kind of new democracy, which is crippled with extreme inequality, increasing unemployment and poverty. And it's this combination of this disappointment, these expectations that aren't met. Um, so there's these aspirations that we had at the dawn of democracy with the reality that people's lives um, are not meeting um, yeah, those goals. And, and it erodes democracy and it erodes people's faith in democratic institutions and its promises. And what the book kind of shows is that over a period of time, how people start increasingly becoming disillusioned with the law, with formal authority, with the constitution, and how, how and in a way, how scary that is for our political sphere and for you know, where our country could go if it's not corrected. And why are Somali convenience store workers the targets of political violence in South Africa? Yeah, that's, a, that's not an, an easy question. And the book tries to, over several chapters, starts kind of um, exploring that. And I'm trying to think of a succinct way of putting it. But it's not so much about widespread animosity towards Somali shopkeepers. There is some, but it's not that everyone, every resident in Philippi or Kailiche or Cryfontaine that I encountered harbored um, yeah, very intense hostility towards foreign shopkeepers. Actually, many of them found businesses convenient. 
many of them um, sent their kids there and had positive encounters with foreign shopkeepers. I would say that these businesses are, are really political pawns. Um, because they're outsiders, because they don't have the same degree of access to formal and informal justice mechanisms, they can be targeted more easily by local political actors um, and they become this pawn between this game between your formal um, state and informal politics. And so often you find during protests, um, informal political actors will threaten to target foreign businesses and threaten xenophobia. And then as a way almost to keep the state on its toes. So, but it, it's very complicated and I recommend <laughs> you read the book to try and understand that kind of process and that interplay. Um, and that's not to say that it's not about xenophobia and anti-immigrant sentiment. That's, that's one factor, but it's also got to do with this interplay between um, informal politics, formal politics, and also extreme discontent and frustration that you find like in many low-income impoverished communities where anyone, when someone threatens looting, lots of people join in just spontaneously, not even knowing what the protest is about. And it's all these different ingredients that contribute. And you write that while the doors of neighborhood forums were mostly closed to foreign traders, the gates of the formal justice system seemed to lead frustratingly to dead ends. So can you tell us more about how foreign traders have lost faith in the country's justice system, as police always gave them many reasons for failed outcomes of their investigations? I think it's partially because the emphasis of the police of many in the government sector is on regulation more than crime so for many years there'd be um, assassinations or robberies and the question then would be well how do we regulate the shops and the priority should in my view have been on how do we deal with rampant crime and there are many challenges that police faced investigating crime affecting Somali shopkeepers and foreign shopkeepers, such as language barriers. Traders seem to move around a lot, so they wouldn't settle permanently in Kailicha. They'd settle there for three years and then move to another area. Um, but all of this called for actually a better strategy by police to try and investigate crimes. So it could have been hiring translators, it could have been keeping better contact of witnesses, um, it could have been allowing witnesses to testify remotely. But there was no real investment in anything like that that I came across. Rather, um, it was about how do we regulate businesses, how do we enforce bylaws? And, you know, strangely, there weren't actually any bylaws saying foreigners can't open businesses in Cape Town. And as a result, the crime escalated and traders became, foreign traders became more and more disillusioned with the formal justice system. Um, and now we basically at a point where there's rampant, there, rampant extortion networks in the city's um, townships. And how best should the marginalized seek out justice in the country? Yeah, and that's sort of a, a question because one of the themes in the book is the issue of pariahdom. And the way I think of it is how traders didn't have the power of the elite. They didn't have money. They didn't have education. They didn't have professional qualifications. Um, and at the same time, they didn't have access to um, popular support. They didn't have the numbers. They're a small minority. And so it explores this predicament of being a minority and at the same time not having any other form of power to draw on. And how do you try and pursue justice and rights in that context? And it's quite extraordinary how they did that. And I think towards the end of the book, I try and propose um, some suggestions for how, how to pursue justice from that perspective. But it, it's very much about. Um, 
engaging in community forums, in navigating informal laws, secretly kind of sidestepping things. Um, and so that's what I found happening in townships. There wasn't a lot of confrontation. It was very much hearing people out, um, sort of being keeping to the side, keeping to the shadows, and kind of just carrying on with their everyday activities. But there's a problem with that, although maybe they're being unconfrontational and kind of keeping out of the way, um, it can has its um, benefits. At the end of the day, it didn't challenge the discourses that were arising at these meetings, which was very problematic. It didn't challenge um, perceptions of foreigners as monopolistic, as unhygienic, as deviant, as threatening. And so, yeah, I think that was the drawback of some of the strategies that were being used by foreigners, although it's not easy when you're threatened with violence. And lastly, Vanya, what are you hoping people take away after reading this book? I think it's about foreign shopkeepers but it's also about South Africa. And it's really to try and understand um, where we are, well, where South Africa is as a country right now and how its politics works and some of the problematical trends which are emerging from the type of politics that exists um, in terms of the rule of law, in terms of our political values and principles um, and how it might be impacting on marginal people now, but when that becomes the norm and when this kind of populist politics that we see becomes dominant, I think all South Africans are, can be threatened by it, anyone. And it's, it's not just a, a, a trend in South Africa, it's actually quite a global trend which many countries are experiencing right now because of global uncertainty and um, migration and, you know, democracy and the types of plurality that you see today. That was Vanya Castro speaking to Crimea Media's polity about citizen and pariah, Somali traders and the regulation of difference in South Africa.